Well, thank you all for coming. I'll begin with the obvious. Uh, we're here in support of the House's compromise position on SB 498, which would decriminalize possession of up to one quarter ounce of marijuana for first offenses only. Uh, we, we do not support the Senate's version of the bill, which would maintain criminal penalties against all marijuana possession, even for first offenses. The Senate's version may appear to be a softening of penalties in some respects, but in actuality, it would increase the minimum fine associated with marijuana possession cases from $350 to $500. In light of public opinion on this subject, we find any increase in marijuana penalties to be unacceptable on its face. On another level, I would like to talk briefly about how the Senate and the governor's office have repeatedly failed to represent the people of New Hampshire on this issue. Polls show that Granite Staters now support legalization by a more than two to one margin. I don't mean decriminalization. That has a whopping 72% support. And I don't mean for first offenses. I'm talking about legalization, which is being seriously discussed by legislatures uh, across New England and, and elsewhere around the country. Grant Staters support legalization by a 62 to 30 percent margin, according to the most recent Granite State poll. Um, while the majority of the New Hampshire Senate continues to keep its head buried in the sand on marijuana policy, and while this obstructionism continues to pass in some circles for leadership, there is a much more advanced and important conversation happening all around us. And it's a conversation that voters obviously believe should be taking place here in the Granite State. So for those of you that don't know, in November of this year in Massachusetts and Maine, voters will be voting on whether or not to legalize and regulate marijuana, to end prohibition and try to take billions of dollars in marijuana sales out of the illicit market and move it into a regulated system. That's not what we're here to talk about today. That's not what a, a conversation this legislature has even been willing to have. But it's something that voters support by more than two to one in this state, and it should at least be talked about here. In Vermont, where I spent this session, the Senate passed a legalization bill. It didn't make it through the House, but it's a matter of time before Vermont legalizes marijuana. In Canada, uh, the Prime Minister and, and the, the current government are moving forward on legalization. The, the Prime Minister has said, figure out how to do this, and, and in a year's time, we'll start doing it. So we're surrounded by jurisdictions that are moving towards legalization. And what makes New Hampshire different? Well, it's not public opinion, okay? Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, and Canada all have one thing in common. They don't actually have 62 to 30 in support of legalization. In none of those states has there been a poll showing as much support as there is in New Hampshire, and yet somehow we're not even able to even talk about that. We're stuck discussing whether first offenses should or shouldn't be a violation or a criminal offense that can haunt a person for life. But here we are in the spirit of compromise and incremental progress, still talking about this baby step and still facing strong opposition from prohibitionists. And in fact, two of the senators who were on the committee conference opposed allowing cannabis even for seriously ill patients who were seeking alternatives to prescribed opioids back in 2013. One of those two senators is running for governor, and I would guess that she's just going to have to learn the hard way that opposing decriminalization is not an issue that's going to work well uh, in an election season. <clears throat> Regardless of all that, the continued existence of this ratty old sign should be considered downright embarrassing in a state that so obviously needs to start bringing its drug policies out of the 1980s and into the 20th century. Simply put, cannabis is not responsible for causing the opioid epidemic, and there is no reason whatsoever to believe that perpetuating a failed marijuana policy is going to have a positive impact on that problem, which we all agree is very serious. To the contrary, decriminalizing marijuana possession would significantly reduce the amount of time the police and courts waste dealing with low-level possession offenses, freeing up more time and resources to deal with more pressing matters, including the opiate problem, violent crime, and other threats to public safety. 
So in light of public opinion and in light of the New Hampshire Constitution, which reminds us that all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense, we urge the Committee of Conference to support the House's proposed compromise. For police and courts, this change would mean less time spent on low-level marijuana possession cases. For the offenders, it would simply mean a second chance, an opportunity to avoid being strapped with a criminal record that can carry lifelong negative consequences. As political realists, we understand that a committee of conference has to be unanimous, and we know that three senators that have been named to this committee have not supported reducing marijuana penalties to a violation. So I don't think any of us are going to hold our breath today in anticipation of a great result, uh, but there, there is a bright side, and it is election season. Five of the senators who have vigorously opposed even reducing penalties for first offenses are not seeking re-election. The governor is not seeking re-election. So this is an issue that's going to be talked about this summer and fall. It's going to be a campaign issue, I think, uh, on a level that it has not been previously. So we're going to lose today on this bill. Something might happen that something might be an inch or two in the right direction, or the bill may just die. But regardless, this issue continues to build public support and that's not going to change. So I will, uh, I'd love to bring up the sponsor of this year's excellent decriminalization bill that's already been killed by the Senate, uh, Representative Adam Schrader. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, I'll be brief because this is the seventh or eighth time the House has sent a bill like this over to the Senate. Um, and I um, just want to say that I support the House position on, um, on uh, Senate Bill 498 as amended because, it, as the Seacoast Media Group put it, it's a reasonable, humane, and fiscally responsible improvement to our state's policy regarding marijuana possession. Uh, Matt mentioned um, the New Hampshire Constitution and that the punishment ought to fit the crime. I think uh, if we're honest with ourselves, um, we would all agree that possession of marijuana and the severity of the penalties associated with that should not be equal to possession of heroin, as it currently is. Um, I will continue to support these improvements uh, in policy because regardless of what you think about marijuana or marijuana legalization, I hope we can all agree that our current penalties are excessively harsh and ought to be reduced. We should pass this bill today, if we can, um, so we can allow police and courts to focus their limited resources on more serious crimes. For offenses, this is a, a, a line you've heard me say before, for offenses involving simple marijuana possession, a fine would be just fine for New Hampshire. Thank you. Attorney Toomey. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Paul Toomey. I'm from Chichester, New Hampshire. i um, here to speak about sort of the intersection of the legal and medical consequences of the continued criminalization of the possession of a, a small amount of a plant. Um, my, just briefly, my background is I, I grew up in a poor community where I saw people being arrested and put in jail all the time. I then became a criminal defense lawyer for indigents, first with Wisconsin Indian Legal Services and then with the New Hampshire Public Defender System. About half of my life has been spent defending indigent people. Um, I have a very clear awareness of what happens to people when they enter the criminal justice system. Um, this isn't a question of whether or not marijuana should be legal or illegal or whether you think um, that it's a, a health issue or, or not. It's a question of how you deal with the fact that a, a person gets caught for a first offense with a very small amount of it. Is it appropriate to take that person and put them into a cage, give them a criminal record and send them down a different path in life? Now, whatever, I don't think it is clearly, but more what I, think or don't think is quite as important as what the American Academy of Pediatrics, the nation's doctors for children say. And we've been doing it, with, we've doubled down over, over penalties for marijuana and drugs for the last 40 years. If that worked, we would have a lower rate of, of drug use, marijuana use, opiate deaths, et cetera. Maine, since 1976, 40 years ago, they decriminalized marijuana. They have lower rates of everything I just said. Um, the criminalization, if, if for any other reason you should support decriminalization, it's because putting people in jail cells doesn't do anything to address a health problem, if it is a health problem. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Questions? Media? 
Bill, I can see you've got one. If, uh, if, sure. If, if this becomes legalized, what happens to the people in prison? Will they be let out? Um, Retroactively? This bill only affects penalties for possession of a quarter ounce or less of marijuana, and well, the Senate version would affect penalties up to an ounce or less. I'm not aware of anybody being in prison for simple marijuana possession. We don't have the room to put people in jails and prisons. So what happens now when somebody is caught with a small amount of marijuana is they get arrested, they get an arrest record. It takes the police officer time, it takes the offender time. Then they all have to go to court. It takes up the court's time, the judge's time, the police officer's time, the offender's time. At the end of the day, they get a fine, and they get a criminal record that can haunt them for life. The House's position would reduce for first offenses only, quarter rounds or less only, it would make it a non-arrestable offense. The police officer would write a hand summons, he would confiscate your small amount of marijuana, it would take two minutes of his time, two minutes of your time, and you would pay that through the mail and you would not get a criminal record. You would get a second chance to have a clean record. So it's not about emptying, <laughs> oh, this is, we could talk about over incarceration in, in some other context, but uh, reducing marijuana penalties is, is not going to have that effect. But it, Matt? Yes. Matt, can I Paul, please do. Please do. I, I think what Matt said is entirely accurate, that at the end of the process, people very rarely get sent to jail. Um, I focus at the beginning of the process where poor people do get denied bail, and, and just the fact of being put in handcuffs and taken to a police station and sitting there in a cage for six or seven hours, that's incarceration. That has an effect on a young mind and a young child. Um, some people like Jeff Pendleton have to stay in jail pre-trial, even though they're never going to get a jail sentence afterwards. Mr. Pendleton, as I said earlier, was going to wait 30 days before he was going to get his fine in a cell, in a cage. Thanks for that. Dennis? What is the primary and what resources are available to help voters ensure they are not <laughs> accidentally voting for a prohibitionist? Well, as you may know, Mr. Goddard, thank you for that question. Every election for the last, shoot, dating back to 2008, I'm pretty sure I have published a detailed voter guide on the positions of all candidates, uh, at least for state senate and governor. It's kind of hard to do one on the 400 member house and it's less important at this point because they overwhelmingly support decrim and in fact passed a legalization bill a couple years ago. So the real issue is the 24 member senate and the governor's office. I've already been talking to prospective candidates for those races. The filing period is early June. And so I will send surveys to, to all Senate candidates, all gubernatorial candidates. I'll try to meet with as many of them who will be willing to chat with me and I will publish a detailed voter guide that can be shared all over the internet and people can be informed. In the back. Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering why, in your personal opinion, why there has been so much hesitation in getting this law through. But when it came to response to the heroin epidemic here in New Hampshire, basically it's more or less become legal and acceptable and okay, and you don't really get in trouble for small amounts, and they want to bend over backwards to help you, and instead of arresting you, they send you off with your Narcane and um, let you do it again. So with something so dangerous like that, why have there been so many problems trying to pass this law or even trying to get any kind of marijuana reform in the state when we know marijuana isn't what's killing everybody? That's an interesting question. I'm not going to comment on heroin policy because that's outside the scope generally of, of, of what we're here to discuss. But why has there been so much hesitation? Uh, I think there are a few answers. One is that people grew up with the idea of the gateway theory being ingrained in our heads. And marijuana may not be all that bad in and of itself, but it's a drug. And it's in the basket with all these other drugs. And therefore, it's guilty by association. And we need to, if we want to send a clear message that drugs are bad, we have to be against all of them, except the alcohol that we sell on the side of the road and the, the tobacco that kills about half a million Americans each year. So those two things, I mean, I, I grew up in the 80s. Alcohol and tobacco weren't considered drugs. There wasn't a war on those. Those were celebrated. But we had a war on drugs that was characterized by intolerance. 
Uh, the former first lady said we have a duty to be intolerant of drug use anywhere by anybody. And that was, that's the, the reality of how people came of age politically generally. M most of the current senators lived through that area and through that era. So when there's a drug problem, a lot of them revert to the, oh my gosh, we have, it must be marijuana's fault. We need to crack down on marijuana. Public sees through that even you know, across the demographics. I've got a handout up here that, that illustrates that not only decrim, but legalization is more popular than any New Hampshire politician. And it's just gonna take another election, I think, before that really sinks in. That yes, people are freaked out about drugs, and rightly so. People are dying, and it is a crisis. But at the same time, marijuana prohibition is not helping. It's only making things worse. And for so many people, uh, marijuana, we've heard in the medical marijuana debates, has been a gateway back from addiction to, to opioids and opioids. So I'm not going to go down the hole of talking about how restrictive our medical marijuana program is and how so many patients still have medicine cabinets full of opioids and can't possibly get on the registry because they just aren't sick enough. That's a conversation for another day. but. We're just trying to get first offenses to be a violation here. So the, the logic of marijuana prohibition, as I, as I understand it, especially in the medical area, is that they have to keep marijuana harder to get than opiates because use of marijuana might lead to opiate use. Are these people insane? Perhaps. Thank you all for coming. Be in State House Room 100. Good morning, everybody, and I apologize for uh, starting this a little bit later. Um, we're supposed to be in two different places at the same time. Um, it is committee conference time, so I apologize again for us um, uh, for being late. And Representative Welsh, would you like to um, make some comments? Well, the, the marijuana issue is uh, one of the most dealt with over the years. Mm -hmm. This year, the difference appears to be in the Senate version, the fine has increased to five hundred dollars, which we thought was a little, uh, a little bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking okay. that we should have uh, at least keep it the same at three fifty. Okay, um, I've conferred with uh, my Senate conferees, and we were we are amenable to lowering the fine to three hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, I just, you know, I, do, I, I appreciate the Senate's uh, perspective on it. I, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to a point where we could reduce the first offense to a violation. Um, we'll just consider this an ongoing process, and, and I'm not going to stand in the way of, you know, of the bill as the Senate is presented, with the caveat that we're going to not increase the fine. <coughs> So just for <coughs> clarification purposes, we're going back to the Senate version, and we are just taking the $500 penalty down to 350 That's my understanding. Okay. So are we all in agreement? Okay. Thank you all very much. I'll have the paperwork ready. Thanks for nothing. Thank you.